Okay, good morning, everybody. This is the Potomac Community Cabal meeting. It is Thursday, November 18th, 2021. We have three topics that we're going to be talking about today. First one is going to be about the Podman IO redesign that Maureen Duffy has put together. The second will be talking about boarding PlayCube HTTP AI config maps query parameter to the container engine. Rivashi, I think, is leading that. And then finally, we're going to be discussing adding Docker IO to unqualified image names. And there is a PR that's in the HackMD if you want to take a look at it and pull it up in advance. And we've got a couple of people here to discuss that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Maureen. Maureen, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, let me just share my screen real quick. And there is a link to if you want to play around on your own with the mockups. Um, I put a link in the HackMD. Um, am I presenting the right screen? I am. OK, good. Okay. Yeah, so I, I'll just walk through. Um, I, I started by looking at the current site and sort of mapping it out um, just, just to kind of get a feel for what's there and kind of how it all flows together. Um, anything that has like blue is an offsite link and anything that's yellow is on the website. And, you know, in, in looking at sort of restructuring and redesigning the site, um, I, I looked at the content that was there and sort of how I felt it would be more accessible and like there were a few sites I looked at like one that I really liked was the GTK website actually it's um a really nice kind of layout so I think if if you're familiar with this site at all you'll kind of see how I maybe stole a little bit of uh, ideas from it but um what I what I did is I started with the front page and I was thinking that sort of the main audience we might want to be reaching to is we really want folks to be using Podman to, you know, work with containers. And so I felt like, you know, because there's other people in the market that they may already be using, we might want to make a pitch sort of like, well, why, why, why move everything? If I'm already doing container stuff, why would I use Podman? So I sort of stole from Dan's talks, like his points about like no big fat demons and you don't need root and all that stuff. And I kind of just gave a slug for each here and just note that this this is actually just a pencil sketch it's not the final artwork the final artwork i actually started doing this guy um he's like the big fat demon i guess <laughs> with a little whale on his shirt um anyway so th this artwork would be finalized so this is just placeholder right now um but uh, you know it, it's sort of like your standard sort of platform programming tool type of website where you have like the big hero splash the latest stable release, get started will point to the get started page. You can download it. And then there's a prominent link to GitHub, prominent link to the docs, and then just the general site nav. So you'll see that I like shifted the navigation a little bit from what it is currently. But um, I feel like this, it's, it's kind of, it's more what a user would, I think, be expecting to visit podman.io. So. Anyway, yeah, so I have this whole big call to, you know, give us a try, this is why kind of section like right on the front page. Um, and then also this is from the work that you guys actually put together in a doc for me. There's some conversation back and forth on like what tools are compatible with Podman. And I know there's still some discussion there, so we could be adding or removing stuff from here. We don't have permission to put these here yet. So I think once we figure out what we're definitely gonna have listed here, we'll probably have to seek the appropriate permissions, whatever to be using logos. But, you know, I thought it would be good too to highlight, especially since um, I'm thinking we're making a call to developers to want to use Podman. Like these are tools that you already use that we're compatible with. I think that's kind of an important message to have right up front. And then you guys have such a well-maintained blog with so much regular content. I thought that that should be really highlighted up front too. So there's sort of just, th these are, all of these were actually links to, um, it was a Red Hat site, I forget the name of it, but they all had these placeholder images. But I mean, we can make like a series of different, you know, if, if the blog post doesn't actually have an image, we can make a series of filler images that it could just select randomly, or I could just design it so it doesn't have an image, it's up to you guys, but it's just an idea. And then I thought, you know, we have the coloring book, um, it gets talked about every now and then, especially for people new to Podman. Um, so I thought maybe have a promo for it, uh, obviously biased, but I thought it might be nice and it kind of makes the page look a little bit more fun. 
And then this area, I probably need some help if we have any kind of one-liner to talk about just the general containers org and all the tools and how they fit together. Just some sort of simple one-liner here, because it, it might be that folks are aware of Podman, but maybe they're not aware of the other tools as much as they could be. Um, and then I just left the general footer here. Um, I'm just going to stop here because there's three more designs to go through, but I just wanted to know if there was any feedback or changes or anything that you have for the front page here. This looks absolutely fantastic. Yeah, okay. it looks cool. It's really, really awesome. And my my only question about it, I, I, the look and feel is awesome, yep. or as, as expected, is how, how would we update this six months a year from now? How, where would this live, do you think? Because this isn't going to be a GitHub Pages page. So it think. could be. It, it could, could be. be. So um, I have been working with the Chris Project, too. If you look at chrisproject.org, um, that site is a GitHub Pages. And it's it's right now, we, we use Jekyll and ASCII doc. Although we started with Markdown, so like we're in the process of converting from Markdown to ASCII doc. But apparently, like one of the advantages of using ASCII doc, and I'm no, by, by no means an expert, but this is what I understand, is you could have one sort of source of truth ASCII doc file that generates multiple documents. And to keep them updated, you only update sort of the mother ASCII doc file. So for example, like for, for like the get started page, it has some instructions i'm trying to oh my computer's moving real slow now um uh everything is a little bit frozen but i'm not going to play with it too much but anyway on the get started page it has some introductory information about like how to install podman and stuff like that so you could just have well even like the contributing file right so that has stuff that's sort of um how to first get started you know filing an issue or submitting a PR. And it would be a total pain to maintain like one version of that content for the web page and then a separate version for the contributing file. So, you know, I'm imagining there could be a way to have that file as an ASCII doc file. And when you do the GitHub pages build, it'll look at that file. And I think if you tag it correctly, like if you make sections in ASCII doc, you could have the page pull just the section. Cause it, and let me see if it'll let me, okay, good. It's letting me scroll now. So I'll show you, like, I have this section here about submitting issues and pull requests. And most of this is ripped just from the contributing file. So like this section, you could put um, tags in ASCII doc as this is like the basic section. And for more extended information, that could live in the contributing file. But um, when when you build the website, it'll just grab the one section relevant to the website and it could ignore the rest. So like the main the main point here is I'm I'm thinking that this could be done using GitHub pages, using ASCII doc as the vehicle so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you only have one bit of content. Like it's not giving you extra burden to maintain stuff, I'm hoping. Um, what what are you using right now in terms of generating this site? Is it Jekyll based or something else? Yeah, it's all Jekyll based right now. Um, oh, just just okay. straight PRs into into a GitHub. Okay, so I I don't think it would be uh in terms of process. I don't think it would be much different. I think that the secret sauce here is converting it to Jekyll using ASCII doc and then just tagging the files that the content is getting pulled from appropriately, so that only the content needed for the web page is getting pulled. So you know you don't want to pull all of the contributing file just the little bits into the divs of the page that it should go in. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just, you know, maybe this is a deeper dive later. It's just how we would do that as far as the contributing page on Podman, GitHub rather than, the, it wouldn't be living on podman.io, right? Yeah, well, it, I mean, wherever you want the content to live, yeah, I mean, what you might, yeah, and maybe it's getting too into the weeds, but you, yeah. you basically pick where where do you want the content, want its real home to be, and then I, I think there's a way to pull it in from a different repo, but I, I'd have to look into that. And Tom, I'd love to set up a deeper meeting where like anybody that's interested that could like join and we could walk through it and maybe even set up a dev site so we could like start to like practice what it would be like to update it with a dev site. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to be yeah. completely upfront. Like, I haven't done a site this complicated using this mechanism yet. I started doing this for ChrisProject.org, but we haven't fully realized what we're trying to do there. Um, so, you know, it haven't fully done this before. I've gotten close. Yeah, 
It's always like, fun to break new ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean it's a worthwhile endeavor, I think, if we can if we can make it happen. Um Yeah, I do okay, too. So I can move on. Um this is the community page. It just it gets started is normally next, but I, I don't know, the file's out of order and I don't wanna push the uh computer running slow gods. Um, so this is basically the main place you would point people if they wanted to join the community. And there were a few things that I thought would be nice to have that you could probably drop, but I figured I'd put them there as good brain food. Um, the first thing up front is I have like a code of conduct sort of reminder thing that I think is good because I think that, you know, you guys have a very open and upfront community and you say, you know, everybody is welcome and we want to hear all your ideas and no PR is too small. And I, I have noticed a number of times where like the code of conduct has been emphasized, like we don't talk that way in this project, you know, whatever. So I, I, you know, I feel like you guys live it anyway, but I think it's good to point out up front so people know that you take it seriously. So I figured it'd be good to have a little sort of disclaimer or whatever there. And then here, so I broke this down into chat, meetings, mailing list, and then contributing. Um, the chat area, um, so you mentioned that that is like certain time zones that people are available on. I thought maybe it just like a silly JavaScript could say the current time. So just to set people's expectations, but that's obviously something that's superfluous. You don't really need it, but I thought it would be fun. Um, and then these would just link over. I feel like the IRC one would probably link to a sub page the way you have now that just explains you have to register to Libera and this is how you do it. I think that that's a smart way to go. The other ones could probably just link directly to those those resources. Um, the meetings, you guys have a ton of content there. Um, and I had talked to Tom before this meeting about potentially pushing meeting recordings to YouTube or something like that. Because when you put stuff on YouTube, number one, you get the network effect of if somebody is Googling for containers or Podman, the videos might actually come up and it might pull people into the community. But the other Plus thing one. is that I think that yeah. And then um, when you uh, use YouTube, you kind of get these little widgets that you can use to embed the video. So that might be nice to actually just embed like, you know, the couple most recent meetings into the page. So it just it has more of a feeling of, oh, wow, these guys are meeting actively and here's the meeting um, videos and I can follow along kind of thing. Um, I love and here, that. Like I, the join meeting and meeting agenda links are sort of up front, too. Um, you know, they're there and they're accessible on the current website, but I feel like pulling them up a little bit higher, you know, will make it more approachable maybe. So I don't know. And then just the meeting purpose for each meeting, I thought. And then this might be funky, but I made the cabal purple because the two names of the meetings are so similar. I'm just trying to like diff them, if that makes sense. So people knew that there was a difference between the two. Um, and then here I was just thinking, just show the most recent two meetings. And then if people want to go further, you could just use like a disclosure thing. So. That's that. Just, the mailing list. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Just as an FYI, I, I just created a YouTube channel a couple of days ago, literally. I, I've had oh, nice. oh, yeah. I saw your IRC meeting on, or IRC message on that. Um, yeah. So, that, I mean, that again, and it, it's what you guys want to do. Um, I think I'd asked a couple people that I know run Fedora meetings that also have a YouTube component. And apparently, I had thought they had some magic where they live streamed and then it automatically saved the recording. Um, apparently no, they manually upload them, which I feel like is a bit of a bummer. I, I have a setup for my Fedora meetings where we use Jitsi and we live stream to Peertube. And I like it because when the meeting's over, it I don't have to upload anything. It just automatically lists it. I know that there's a YouTube live feature that lets you do that, but I don't know if our corporate account allows you to do it. You might have to have like a kind of a, a non-bread hat Google account to do that, but that might be a nice option too. I just feel like automating things and making it less manual effort is always good. Um, so I'll move on. This is the mailing list section is basically, hey, there's a mailing list. It, it's basically the text lifted from the current website. There's just, you know, a little bit more styling and screenshots in it. Um, and the same with the issues and pull requests. This one, there was a lot of content. Um, and what I did is I really just cut it down to the essentials from the contributing MD file on the Podman repo. Um, and again, like I said, I, I feel like that should be the canonical source for this and the web page should just sort of pull from that. And if that gets updated, the web page should reflect that. I'm hoping we can work out a system to do that. But that that was the thought behind this. And you know, if it's not possible, we could just say 
have some basics, like real basics that wouldn't ever change. And then just link to the contributing file if that's good enough too. Um, okay, so I can move on from here if you guys want. This is um, the features page. Um, these are more very rough sketches, but I, I don't know if you think it's going too silly with, with the Podman seal, but I, I thought these might be cute. If it's too cute, let me know. We can drop them. So cute. No, <laughs> not too cute at all. Okay, cool. I love it. Um, yeah, so you could see like, and again, these aren't, the illustrations aren't finished. It's just like an idea. Um, but, and I don't know if this was like the right place to put this, but I felt like upfront on the features page is people kind of trying to learn more. So, um, oh, and this should say getting to know Podman. I don't know why the Podman's missing, but it's fine. Um, just some basic first steps, like quick dive into Podman will bring you to the the start get started page. Um, join Podman's community, brings you to the page we were just looking at. Need some help, brings you to those places. And then, so this is where things get a little funky. Um, so this, I thought it would be, I was really inspired for this. If you've ever looked at github.com, not logged in, and you scroll down, they have a lot of like live, um, well, not live, but like animated terminals showing you what you can do with like little things sliding in. So that's what I was thinking about here. Like it, it, it is still, and this is all copy from the existing website or existing materials, find, run, build, share. And so for each one, um, the other ones I kind of laid out really quick here. But the idea is this would be like a little animated terminal typing this out when you're looking at it and stuff would slide in. Kind of hard to show here in this 2D program, but that was the idea here is just to highlight these as being the four main features of Podman. And then I also thought, you know, that cockpit interface is really nice. And I have talked to other folks that I know that aren't, aren't affiliated with Red Hat. They're not, they have no whatever, no horse in the race on any of this. And they found this to be a really impressive thing. And I don't think it's really mentioned on podman.io that much at all, really, maybe in a blog post or two. So I thought that that might be a good thing to highlight, especially if we're trying to maybe onboard folks that, you know, are, are, are less experienced and like the comfort of having a UI. So I thought it would be good to have screenshots just to show some of the features of the cockpit UI. And then here, it's just another highlighting the blog post again, highlighting the help resources. Another pitch for the coloring book because it seemed appropriate. And then that's that. Okay, and then I have just one more here. And this one isn't really fully finished, but this, this is one where like, there's like a general idea and it just basically has to be implemented using the content that's already there. Um, but this really, again, is something that's just totally kind of lifted from the GitHub um, kind of front page when you're not logged in, where it shows you like how you do stuff and like, you know, you have like a little terminal that's animated and little things swoop in to explain as you scroll down the page. That's what I was thinking for, for this. Um, and honestly, like if that's way too much, you know, like with the other things, it could just be dropped and we can make it flat and not animated. That's That works too. Um, um, I like it. Maureen, uh, one of the things that's uh, I think going to get a lot of up potential uptake on non Linux platforms. So I think one of the things we want to make prevalent here is how to do this on a Mac or a Windows platform. Okay. Uh, Maybe the, on the um... one of the issues I think most of us have is we all think in terms of Linux, and then I think the larger community is going to end up being non Linux. So I feel like maybe what we want to do here, and I didn't, I, I didn't actually, I had a little mock-up for what the downloads thing looks like, um, but it's not here right now. But if we had something like right here by the download area on the front, something about available for Linux, Mac, Windows, right? Yeah. And then maybe each, each one, Maybe not Linux, but maybe Windows and Mac. Maybe they'd each have their own pages explaining how to use it on that platform. And then on the features page, maybe we could have a section up front about the supported platforms or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that would be great. Okay. Okay. And and me and Ashley met um a week or two ago about the the Podman for OS X too. And so um, 
I think as she works on that, maybe we could even use screenshots from that and right. have them on the features yep. page. I hate to yeah. close this up too quickly, but we're running out of time. I have a couple of other topics. Sure. Anything, yeah. And that's that's questions? all I have anyway. So. Oh, OK, good. Anybody have any other questions or quick comments for Maureen before we move on? Yeah, we didn't talk about the blogging when we had kicked that topic to this cabal. Yeah, the, the basic idea right now is we have, I think we're very prolific at writing blogs. And um, but one of the things that Brent would like is for us to write shorter blogs that don't need to be go through some kind of review process. Um, basically, like wiki. Yeah, wiki or medium.com. Yeah. Something where we could just sketch together something glee. Um, yeah, we we used to do it on on Medium, but that was so disassociated with the term Podman and Red Hat that we started doing stuff on that Sysadman site, which which you you saw there quite a bit. And we've gotten some pushback about whether or not that's like an official Red Hat's statement view what we write there so it does, we write it like it's representing upstream podman but people are taking like it's official red hat content um, so we're sort of looking for at least i am and i would imagine others on the team we're looking for a place to you know dump stuff when we learn something or figure something out or answer a question or just generally want to blog about containers but not go through an editorial process necessarily and the editorial process would be by the the party hosting like like the red hat um sysadmin blog and not yourselves or yeah well when we use well, same with media though when we use medium it, it one person has to has to review it to publish it if we okay. if we're publishing under the same like podman io name so even if we could find something that we were hoping that we you might have an idea on something that would be more integrated with this website, but also there were other ones like Medium, and I forget who their competitor is, but if there was a way to have, say you could have five or six people, you know, publishing under their name, but it's tagging Podman or whatever, so we can get it out tweeted the whole bit. Yeah, I, well, is there, is there a reason you wouldn't just use Jekyll? Because Jekyll handles that stuff natively. And I mean, you have some blog posts in there. I'm not sure that we're educated enough to know that kind of yeah. stuff on Jekyll. But it's basically, it's basically um, we're trying to avoid the PR process um, and having somebody else review it entirely, just be able to do something quick and easy and blast it out more Twitter-like. OK. I'll think on that. I'll think on that. And All see right. What I can Thank you. What, what I would, yeah. I, I would look at it. I and mean, the way I'm envisioning is is still put stuff at sysadmin dot you know redhat dot yes. but the, I would call those articles as opposed to say blogs, and and maybe it's <laughs> this might just in my brain, but uh, I'm thinking more of you know people ask a question in the mailing list or in the GitHub issue, and we answer it, and then it just gets lost, and and sometimes it's better to instead of just answering it there to write a, little, a quick you know page on if if you're trying to do this in a image this is how you do it and but those things are not big enough or, or or informative enough to put up on you know to go through the full formal process to get you know and and probably says that wouldn't want it anyway right uh, and we don't want dan we don't want to wait till dan gets back from the bahamas <laughs> or to actually be able to be published. On, on that on that mental note, I'm going to uh, close this discussion down. We can dive more deeply into it when we talk again with Maureen in, in the future. But um, Maureen, thank you very much. This is really looking really great. All right. Okay. So next up, Urbishi, forwarding play cube HTTP API configuration config maps query parameter. Please take that away from me so I don't have to say it. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm not sure if I should be leading this, but basically this stemmed from this PR that was opened by Jakob. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. 
Um, essentially, the config, when you have a Kubernetes YAML and you have a config map YAML with that and you're sending it to PlayCube, it's not being passed over correctly um, over the API. So Jakob created a PR to fix that. Um, the solution started with uh, passing in the path to that file instead of passing in the config map data, um, which caused some, which had some pushback and some discussions and also uh, that was between Paul and Jakob. And I think those two should lead it since I see them on the call here and possibly John. Um, to figure out what the best way forward is. Uh, hi, uh, yeah, the, my PR uh, was created because we need support for uh, Go library client for Podman in our project. And uh, the points raised in the PR regarding changing the way it behaves to have a whole solution that doesn't uh, have any exceptions for non-local um, remote calls to the API uh, seems fair and uh, I would be happy to work in on providing support for that. The question is whether uh, the community is open for changing the behavior for that feature in uh, PlayCube. So my, my impression was that the config map feature never worked on remote, right? Because so so there is nothing to break here, basically. When we implement it, we can do it right. The, the question is, how do we want to pass the content of a config map to the server, basically? Yeah, uh, I had a look at the code that currently is implemented around uh, using the YAM that sent over. And because the service accepts multiple uh, objects in the YAML, maybe it can process config maps as well along deployments and pods. So users can provide config maps along pods and deployments in the same content. And then uh, the service can refer to them, use them to provide env environment variables to the workloads and potentially not to change the current behavior uh, signal which config maps should be used by pods by providing it as a separate uh, option for uh, PlayCube. Like a list of names of config maps, not list of files that should be used. And those names should be present in the content sent to the server. That's the rough idea on tackling that. So you would use, you would add a, uh, I guess, Tommel calls them a stanza or to the body of the request for the, yeah. that actually defines the config maps and then a query parameter to point to which map? Yeah, like currently there is the config maps parameter that points to files, but that would be another one, for example, and config maps, which would be the list of names of, of config maps that, that should be used. Uh, okay. And that opens possibility for providing support for config maps as files as well for pods, which is not supported right now, but that's out of scope here. Potentially this could expand this way as well. I mean, I, I have, I like that better because then when we, you know, the Golang or Python bindings uh, wouldn't have to jump through any major hoops. Brent, you're about the only other one that works with the API much. What do you think? I think that I've been working on Rust too long, but um, I mean, I think what's being suggested is reasonable, John, don't you? Yeah, I do. I, I think it's more reasonable than where we are at now. Yeah. Um, Does that, and that satisfies Paul? That, that, that sounds reasonable, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. 
So it sounds like we have a way forward. Yeah. And thank you for your work, Jacob. Thank you. Uh, as I said, I'd like to work potentially on that. If that's okay with you. Yes, uh, please. Maybe I could create a tracking issue in the repository and assign it myself and then work on that. I don't know how that would fit better in the process of uh, Podman development. That's exactly the way we like to do it. <laughs> okay, great. So that's what I'm going to do. Sounds great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, next up, we have, um, is adding Docker IO as a default in an image name. I'm not sure if Michael or Urvashi or Valentin or Dan or who, who's leading this one. I guess it's Michael and myself on one side and Valentin on the other. I can start by exposing the problem. Um, and the reason start no problem real quickly, is... I've added a um, link to the PR in, in the chat if you want to take a look at it. Sorry about that, Michael. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, with the compatibility API from Podman, when we want to use a Docker client, in my case, that for a CI system that use Mogi client, I found out that um, Docker assumes there is only one single registry, which is docker.io. And that helpfully, the client is also removing the registry part from a request to download the image. And Podman do not like that. Uh, for good reason. I totally understand Valentin's point about uh, the security. But uh, we have the choice between being following the security model of Podman. I can see, oh, having two API would not be good if they react differently, or being compatible with Docker. Um, we basically disagree on that, disagree on a lengthy discussion, to be fair. Um, that requires someone to decide on the design. As Valentin uh, said, there is several workarounds, so it's not like completely blocking, but I still think that if I manage to get that, other people using Podman will hit the same issue. Uh, yeah, it's basically it. Uh, I mean, fun fundamentally, um, the, I think the question is, is uh, we're just talking about compatibility library, so this is just for the remote API. Um, on the compatibility la layer, whether or not um, if a short name doesn't expand to insert Docker IO um, as a default. Um, and I, I think we can put some constraints on that in that we could basically look in the list of registries.com to see if Docker IO is available. The problem that Michael has hit is that there are certain libraries and tools that have built to talk to Docker that actually strip out Docker IO, even if the user puts Docker IO in into the, a long name. So basically, it is, I guess there are optimizations or something that strip out Docker.io um, uh, from the name and then sends us a short name, at which point the service side comes back and says, I got three registries. I don't know where the foobar image comes from. Um, and we end up with the problem. And this, this we've covered over this problem, or in balance, was that we solved the problem on Max by basically saying we're just going to hard code Docker IO is the only element in the registry. Um, and registries conf, right? Registry .com. Botman, so, when we do a so Botman machine, we right. enforce Docker IO. Right. So the the question there, and, and Valentin's arguing right now, uh, putting words in his mouth, but I think he's arguing that to solve this problem, we should, you, anybody that wants to have this feature has to force Dario, the only thing registers .conf. Um My opinion is that we should have a workaround in the compatibility library because base Docker is, it, 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 Docker has hard coded Docker IO into their world, and we should, you know, we have to respect that. They're using a sort of acting as to 
to understand that. Um, and I, I think that having too many people stumble upon this, stumble with this, and giving them a bad experience by not doing what they would expect. Um, to 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 continue to to ignore it or to tell them that they have to somehow go in and change the defaults um to register.com all the time all right so let me let me share my opinion on it so uh first i want to say that dan is also arguing against uh you're arguing against yourself because we had multiple times consensus on doing how we're doing it at the moment um second is we will never be entirely compatible with docker then you're giving an echo at the moment um, we will never be entirely compatible with docker because we have aliases so even if docker wants to resolve foo to docker library foo and we have an alias to foo at my point somewhere entirely different um so we will never be entirely compatible there also if we care about that what do we say to people on the cli i mean where do we draw the line we want people to have you know migrating on the cli to have the same experience um uh, there we if i could clarify the cli point i think we have a position here we're bug for bug compatible on the api and the compatible api only we can do our own thing on the command line as long as it makes sense but the compat api is different and has a different compatibility promise there i have a, another thing to add because we also need to be compatible with atomic docker and atomic docker supports the search registries um third point would be if we just or if we start changing that now we're probably breaking existing users who rely on that so this is something we must not forget it's changing one thing for another the fourth point which users won't care about but i do since well i i maintain large part of uh, of these uh of the stack is it will be a pain, a huge pain, to force or enforce resolving to Docker I/O only in the compat layers because this is not how the code is structured. Um, the source of truth of truth is containers image, and this is where all of these things happen. We do not have a consistent way to pass around a system context enforcing that information so it would be a huge uh, undertaking because the compat api also uses builder it uses containers common and so on but this is a I, I think a weak argument for users perspective because this is something the maintainers have to do um but it would be it would be something to consider it would be a considerable amount of work to get there so also, if users really want that, well, I, I really think that registries conf is, is the way to go. Um, many distributions only configure the search registries to Docker IO. Um, we don't. By we, I mean Fedora, CentOS, RHEL. So this is something that probably only users in the Fedora world will, will, will encounter. May I propose that my position on this is that I think that we do have to support the Docker IO use case, even in situations where people have multiple registries set up. However, I also recognize Valentin's position that Docker on rail boxes did not do this. So I'm gonna propose that we have a containers conf configuration flag to set whether it's enabled and it should be default on. So default should be the combat API does Docker IO only. And then for RHEL, we can flip that back over. So RHEL retains the same experience, whereas everyone else will get Docker IO by default. As for whether we're going to break anyone who is an existing user of this, I don't really know if there are any. Uh, 
I get the impression that anyone who wants something that's outside of Docker.io is using fully qualified names anyways, because otherwise you will run into our short name enforcement, which still isn't enabled for the remote API. And I don't think we're going to enable it for reference. But... I, I was going to suggest that containers.conf change to the only thing I, well, first of all, going back to Valentin's ideas that, that uh, rel sevens docker support affects us I, we've never supported any type of remote api um for docker or a pass we don't support it now we don't support docker compose we don't support um docker py other than you know from a rel, red hat's perspective we don't support it is what i'm saying upstream show we we you know we support it um so I don't I, I don't buy the argument for, for Docker in rel seven. Rel seven is pretty much did at this point from a upstream point point of view. Um, so having something that switches it back and forth, uh, uh, you know, allowing people to choose whether they want to have which which level of compatibility. I don't think we should have a separate setting for rel because I think the most people on rel are going to want the Docker IO. Um, you know, to, to, you know, the, the tools to just work. Um, and going back to Valentin saying that, that I'm changing my opinion, I reserve the right to change my opinion as as new data comes in. So, um, oh, well, I, I just, I just see it's, it's just getting so often that we're hitting this that you know, it's like we're, we're. I'm not sure that happens so, so often. Well, and I mean, so no, we had no offense, but so far, it's, it's my We've had a major problem on the Mac. We've had a major, major you know, this problem come up. Um, and I don't see us having, I don't see us having problems on the other side where people are going to say, you know, how come that, how come compatibility mode doesn't work with multiple registries? Well, the last time we talked about it um, in the context on the Mac, we were also talking explicitly about that. And the agreement was, it's a sad fact of life. Um, I'm also willing willing to change, but I need us to make to make a decision once because right. um, at, at, at some point we need just to, to stick with one decision and then drive with it. Just in case there is consensus, uh, I'm. It, it's unfortunate that Miloslav isn't here because Miloslav and I would probably be the ones who unfortunately have to implement this stuff, and this will be a huge pain. Um, but when, when it mostly be implemented on the plugin side, I don't know why this. Uh, no, 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 because we have short name resolution in Builder as well. We have short name resolution in um, Containers Common as well, yeah. and we have to pass down the information in the code that we're running in the compat side. There's no way we can control that via an environment variable or things like that. So this probably means breaking changes of Builder APIs. Uh, uh, as well, so I'm as a as a maintainer, I'm I'm very reluctant to it. I sympathize with the idea from a user's perspective, but looking at the code, this will be a lot of work. So seeing our priorities, I'm not sure, or I'm pessimistic. We'll get that for Portman for all. My question is, does it have to be a breaking change? This strikes me as an added field, not uh, what do you call it a necessarily a breaking field. You'd have a new field that defaults to false and behaviors the same. And if you set it to true, we get the Docker IO only behavior. So I'll so, delete it something yeah. we need to pass down via the system context. And um, I doubt we have, so a container image system context, I doubt that all APIs use that consistently. But if, so if we had a, a field in the system context that said, Use Docker IO mode. Like that to me would seem like it would would help. It was easier, a lot easier, right? So that if I go that's through the, your, that's the only way the compatibility mad mode, it just changes the system context to say use Docker IO mode, and which means that if if we're going to expand a short name, we're just going to expand it with Docker IO and nothing else, right?
but we need to pass down the system context from Potman, from the combat layers, which goes through containers common and builder. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll throw my two cents in, if it, if it would help. I, yeah. I guess I, what I'm really struggling with here, in all honesty, is if some, if we take Docker out of this and someone said something like this, hey, we've got an API, and one of the fields is an image, <clears throat> and there can be multiple registries. On an API level, I'd say I want I want the fully qualified name. It's an API, so it's programmatic. The short name stuff to me is completely and 100% in support of the CLI so that users don't have to type lengthy names like that. But the, but the problem is to, coming back to this, if Docker doesn't recognize that there are other registries, therefore they define their their API around around that single singular fact. John and I banged our heads against the wall on a lot of this kind of stuff when we were doing the implementation. But from a pure API point, I mean a pure API, I would think that most people would agree. You know, the, the fully qualified name is the way to do this. But Docker doesn't recognize anyone else, so they go with a short name. Yeah, that's because we don't own both ends of the protocol is what really is biting us and Michael. Yeah, right. Um, I Because I would, I would love to dig in my heels and say, no, you have to give me fully qualified names or, you know, go pound sand. Um, unfortunately, um, we've got wild things out there and we can't, you know, we have to make Scott happy and Michael happy. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, for me, the having the server have the flag in containers.conf is a way out um, because then the you know depending on the OS the you know the packager can say you know do we want to be flexible or you know do we want to be secure and if we want to be secure um, if you don't pass us fully qualified names to get to images we're just not going to participate um, but if somebody's like, no, I got to support this tool and it's it's deliberately going out and stripping out these values, um, then, you know, the, the maintainer sysadmin or packager can say, yeah, we'll we'll go for the risk. Um, you know, it's kind of like when we had the discussions about what what empty fields do we need to pass back? to you know across the api you know i was adamant if it's empty why do i have to pass it that's just a waste of time and effort um but we had clients that were just blowing up then you remember java but java was has been the biggest thorn yes because however they're um Unmarshaller works. It it loves to uh, blow up in our face. So, what are the chances that we can convince Moby to change the behavior? Because I know there is some history. I remember Dan Wall speaking of that at DevConf, but uh, it was one pandemic ago, so maybe it's not the same people, and maybe I can just open a bug and submit a patch and it will go there. Or is it like not going to happen because it didn't happen the 50 last time we tried to uh, convince them to change that behavior? But then, then you're muted. Me. Remember, it's recorded. <laughs> yeah. no. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, uh, Hey, my opinion is 
you, you, I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I, I don't. I think this is going to continue to happen. Um, so I don't think that this is necessarily a one-off. Um, but I kind of like the idea of what Matt came up with, and I know Ballantin and and Miloslav are going to push back against it. But I think just adding a flag to the system context is a I want to talk about. If I may elaborate on it, for for the people who don't have to implement it and don't have to worry about the long-term maintainability, it's just one pretty flag yeah. in some config. But when you think about the impact, it's it's really expensive, not only to implement, but also some of the compat endpoints are shared with the Lipoid and Lipot endpoints. So we we have to untangle hundreds or dozens of thousands of lines of code, audit them, think about, do we come from the compat endpoint? Is it a Lipot endpoint? And do this for the rest of our lives, as, as least, at least as long as we maintain uh, this code. It is not done with one PR. It will be a continuous journey. And since there is no way to really set an environment, environment variable or such, um, this is just a lot of work, and this will continue. So whenever somebody adds code and we don't review correctly, probably we introduce a regression. Um, this is something that, as a maintainer, gives me headaches. If it would be something, a global setting, not a hybrid one, because at the moment we talk about a hybrid setting that we can run you know, in the Lipot mode with the the current behavior, and then in the compact mode to change that. This is something that is really expensive. If we would just I, tell I, users to configure it globally, again, just set no, Docker I'm, I'm in the registries conf, right? And you'll be done with it. If you run right, in the compact mode. You're, you're saying that we have a, a developmental cost, and you want to push it onto all users for that cost. Everybody that, everybody that two, two things are going to happen when a user stumbles against this, right? Either, either they're going to open an issue, or we're going to have to pay the penalty for answering the issue, or they're going to say, "Screw it, Podman sucks." Oh, don't those, don't those, get me wrong. Those are two, two human responses: Podman sucks, or they open an issue, and we're going to have to do this this answer, or we pay the. I don't think it's that difficult. Because of the way the compatibility library is set up to basically say, if it's libpod, don't set the flag. If it isn't libpod, then you set the flag. I, I'm happy to review a PR. And uh, I, I don't want the conversation to go into the direction of, you know, I, I understand what it means to be a user. But um, we made already deliberate decisions to not be compatible on various sites. And we made this decision also for the Compat API in this very specific question, also to continue how we are behaving. So I, you know, I, I don't want to be the sole party pooper here. Um, I'm just reminding of the converse, all the right. conversations we already had because they're easily forgotten. So, so I, I think, I'll, I, if I may, I, I well, just want to say, I, before we go there, I just want to say we've got like three minutes left. So um, that's where I was. Up. That's where I was going, actually. I think there's a general consensus that doing the right thing for the user is the way to go. The implementation is what is at issue at this point. Is that fair to say? And Absolutely. as such, as such, we can go away and figure that out. That, that's all I was going to say. I mean, I, I think we all recognize John said it, I said it. Uh, we need to do something here to, to reflect this. Uh, odd behavior that Docker has set in stone. And how we do it, we can, we'll have to just go think about it. I, I, I wouldn't want to implement something this large in a 20 minute conversation anyways. Right. So. I'll just add a bit that I don't think this is going to be quite as bad as Valentin thinks, because while our API has grown in somewhat of a labyrinthine fashion and has a variety of places for images are pulled, to the best of my knowledge, with Docker, 
we have to worry about builds and we have to worry about uh create pull and maybe maybe load but probably not uh and that's an advantage of how they structured their apis but uh build is probably going to be bad now that balance is explained more i think that is probably we're look, going to look at a very breaking change there but create I don't think is necessarily going to be that bad because we already have control of the system context or it's pull technically. I forget the exact name of the endpoint, but pulling images. Good. All right, well, this was a, a great uh, session. With, usually we open it up to uh, other people, but since we have like a minute and a half left, um, um, if anybody has a quick thing, we are oh, going to get out of here. Michael, how's this all sit with you? I'm just curious. Um, I'm fine. I totally understand the part about too complicated to implement because it was a five-line patch, and if suddenly I have to read all the Podman code, we we'll just use the workaround, to be honest. So yep. I totally get that. Should uh -huh. I close my PR because it's not going to be accepted? And I again, I understand why. Uh, with yeah. plenty of complexity involved, so... I think the next step is to go look at compatibility library and figure out where we would have to set this flag to say we're in Docker IO mode. Whether it's just in the spot that Michael did it and then look at how it would be implemented in Builder. So the Builder would do it. Now, why are we speaking about Builder? Because as far as I know, Builder is not using the Compat API. That's only when an external client no, you can do it. As you can do a Docker API build. So we, we in that mode. If you if you did a VR Docker build or, or uh, Docker PY or compose, then we should follow those rules. Thank you. Alrighty, folks. I hate to end a great meeting, but we have run out of time. So I'm going to end it. Thank everybody for attending today, and thanks for the discussions. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Bye.